Hello, my dear students and the rest of the learners. Welcome to this presentation in which we are going to learn about introduction to computer operating systems. And this is part two. This video is a continuation of part one in which we learned about introduction to computer operating systems, and we defined what an operating system is, the parts of operating systems. We looked at the common terminologies or concepts that are related to operating systems. And we also looked at the, the functions of operating systems where we talked about resource management and provision of virtual machine. In part one of the video, which is already posted in the YouTube channel by the name MLSWAP ICT, we also talked about the objectives or the goals of operating systems and the reasons as to why operating systems were developed. My name is Meme JM, and you can call me Emeliswap. And I run a YouTube channel by the name Emeliswap ICT, in which I have covered various topics in the field of ICT and uh, computers. Therefore, in this presentation, we are going to learn about evolution of operating systems, the operating systems structures, the types of operating systems, job control. And lastly, we are going to look at operating systems installation. Welcome. Let's start with looking at the historical development of operating systems, which we also call evolution of operating systems. Operating systems have been evolving through the years and have been historically closely tied to the architecture of the computers on which they run. This means that the operating systems has been developing in tandem or to match with the evolution or the history of computers. For you to be able to remember about or to know about the history of computers, you can look for the video by the title, Introduction to um, Computers or Computer Fundamentals, where you are going to see how the computers developed. And therefore, because in part one of this series, under the video by the name, Introduction to Operating Systems, part one, we said that an operating system is a set of programs that form a portion or a section of what we call systems software. We said that operating systems is a set of programs or a program that normally ensures that the computer or various hardware function as they're supposed to. And we said that whenever you purchase a new computer, the first program that must be installed into it in order to make it function and be ready for you to use is an operating systems. Therefore, as the computer was evolving, as the computer was developing, even from generation one all the way to where we are today, this has also been being controlled or learned by development of operating systems. Remember, when it comes to software and hardware, before you make a certain hardware, you must have in mind of the program or the software that will make that hardware to function. And therefore, this means that software is supposed to be coded fast or a program is supposed to be coded fast 
even before its hardware is made. Because you may make a certain hardware and then that hardware fails to function because there's no software to support it. And therefore, when we say that operating systems have been evolving through the years and they have been historically closely linked to the architecture of computers, we are simply saying that as the computer was evolving, or the operating systems was evolving too. So the programmers had to think of an operating system that is going to support the next generation or the next type or set of computers. And therefore, as the computers were evolving, so were the operating systems. Therefore, the evolution of operating systems spans to five key generations, which are a first generation to fifth generation. In fact, these are the same generations through which the computers developed or through which the computers evolved. And therefore, as the computers were evolving, so was the operating systems. And therefore, you cannot talk of a certain generation of computers, and then you fail to talk about the, the same in terms of operating systems. So let's look at the first generation. The first generation of computers, which we also call the first generation of operating systems, was between the years 1940s to mid 1950s. The computers of the day were electronically characterized or vacuum tubes or what we call thermionic valves. In the 1940s, the earliest electronic digital systems had no operating systems. Electronic systems of this time were programmed on rows of mechanical switches or by jumper wires on plug bones. This informs you, my dear student, and my dear Lana, that when you talk about the first generation of operating systems or first generation of computers, we didn't in fact have an operating system at that time as a software. So what used to be there to inform the computer what is supposed to be done were a row of mechanical switches that were being pressed by the person manually or by jump wires. And these wires could be removed from one part and they're plugged in to another part. And that's how the users gave the first generation of computers instructions. So we can simply say that at this generation, the instructions were being given manually by a person who was controlling that machine. And in fact, the name computer was as a result of the title that was given to the people, the person who was making use of switches or jumpers by plugging them at one point to another or pressing them. That person was professionally called a computer. And therefore, when we talk about first generation, this first generation of operating systems was composed of a person that we call a computer who was manually pressing various switches and pressing or inserting jumper wires on what we call the plug bones. These were special purpose systems that, for example, generated ballistics tables for the military or controlled the printing or payroll checks from data on punched paper cans. After programmable general purpose computers were invented, machine languages consisting of strings of the binary digits zero and one on a punched paper tape were introduced that is sped up the programming process. So what used to happen at this level, my dear students and the rest of the learners is that at this time, the people or the personnel or the specialists that were making use of a computer used what we call a past paper cut. And therefore, certain kind of punches or holes would be created on a piece of paper. The areas that had holes in them were represented by what we are calling a digit zero. And where there was no hole, and therefore the past that were raised 
were being referred to as digit one. And therefore, zeros and ones at this level that were, of course, represented in terms of holes on a piece of paper that we call a punched paper, can't, is what used to hold those instructions. So a series of zeros and a series of ones had a certain meaning based on the person that had created them. So all programming was done in absolute machine language, or even once yet, by wiring up electrical circuits, by connecting thousands of cables to plug bones to control the machine's basic functions. In fact, if the computer or the person that was controlling the computer inserted a jump wire on a certain section of the board, that became a one. Simply means that in, from that section, there was flow of certain electrical currents. But when this person unplugged that jump wire from that section, it simply means that there was no flow of electricity or source of power. And therefore, that was represented as a zero. So in this context, other than the use of uh, punch chickens, when we were using uh, pliables where wires would be inserted, if a wire was inserted on a certain section and therefore there was some flow of electricity or some electrical signals, that was a one meaning there is flow of source of power. But when that cable was disconnected, that became a zero, simply meaning that there was no flow of current. So the circuit was not closed. When the circuit was closed, that was a one, meaning a cable has already been inserted on that section. When the cable is unplugged or was unplugged, that simply means that that was an open circuit. That means a zero. And that's how instructions were being um, stored or created or given or issued into this first generation computer. So that is what machine language meant, or that is what machine language means. So programming languages were not known at that time. Even assembly language was not known. So operating systems were unheard of. The usual mode of operation was for the programmer to sign up for a block of time using the sign up sheet on the wall. Then come down to the machine room, insert his or her plug board into the computer, and they spend the next few hours hoping that none of the 20,000 or so vacuum tubes would burn out during the run. Virtually, all the problems were simple, straightforward numerical calculations. What this means, my dear students, is that if a person had been assigned the duty of going to operate the computer, what this person used to do is that on the wall of that room where this computer was, there was a sheet of paper that people used to sign. Anybody who was to go and operate that computer had to sign up for a certain amount of time to use or to operate that computer. And when this person entered in that machine room where the computer was, the core mandate of this person was to plug in and plug out, plug in and plug out various uh, switches and various uh, jump wires from one party to another, from one party to another. And because this was all about use of on and off, on and off of power, many times the, those vacuum tubes couldn't break down, couldn't get burnt. And therefore it was manual. It was an um, energy involving process. And that's why I've said that these guys, these people that were operating these computers at this time are the ones who are called the computers. They are the people who are the source of the instructions. They are the ones who made decisions of what the computer should do because they were doing it manually and mechanically. And many times these vacuum tubes got burnt. And therefore, more time was spent doing the repairs for the vacuum tubes more than switching on and off or plugging in and plugging off of the, 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 the various um, wires. So virtually, all the problems were simple, straightforward numerical calculations. That means this, the person who is operating the machine is the one who was expected to know what to do. And this was purely about manipulation of switches. 
and wires. So from there, we moved on to the second generation, which was in the mid, between mid 1950s to mid 1960s. The computers at this time were characterized of transistors and bunch systems. So to run a job, that is a program or a set of programs, a programmer would first write the program on paper, then punch it on cans. So this simply means that just as we have said for first generation, where we are using punched cans, the same was happening at this point. So a person will sit down and write the instructions himself or herself on a piece of paper. And then after writing it, this person will take time punching that paper or uh, the person will get a piece of a punching card. And then the same data, same instructions that have been written on a piece of paper will be punched in on the card. Punching, my dear student and my dear listeners, you know what a punch is. A punch creates holes on a piece of paper. So this set of instructions that have been written on a paper will be punched on that card because that is the card that will be inserted in the machine. And therefore, by early 1950s, the routine had improved somewhat with the introduction of punched cans. It was now possible to write programs on the cans and read them instead of using plug balls. Otherwise, the procedure was the same. Simply what we are saying, instead of the person now switching on and off manually or doing the uh, moving jumpers from one point to another, as it was for first generation, that or those set of instructions were now put on a piece of account. So any instruction will be punched on a punched card. And therefore, instead of somebody being involved and engaged in switching on and switching off, moving gears and doing all that other stuff mechanically, that piece of instruction or that program would be punched on a piece of paper, which would be in terms of holes. And then these are the cans that were inserted on the machine. So a computer could execute only one program at a time. Each user had the sole use of computer for a limited period of time and would arrive at a scheduled time with the program and data on punched paper cards or punched tape. Punched tape. I'm emphasizing this one to my dear students so that you can really understand what we mean. The program would be loaded into the machine. In other words, these punched cans or punched tapes would now be inserted into the machine and the machine would be set to work until the program completed or crashed. There was no guarantee that the machine would work properly up to the end. So sometimes it was the prayer of the person who has written the piece of, the, 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 the piece of instructions or the set of instructions on the punched can for the machine to operate up to the end. So it was his or her prayer that the machine will not crash before the set of instructions are all executed. So programs could generally be debugged via a front panel using toggle switches and panel lights. Much computer time was wasted while operators were walking around the machine room. People then quickly looked for ways to reduce the wasted time. The solution generally adopted was the bunch system. The idea behind this was to collect a tray full of jobs. Remember when I say a tray full of jobs, these jobs are the instructions and they are represented on punched cans in the form of punches or holes in the input room and then read them into a magnetic tape using a small, relatively inexpensive computer, which was quite good at reading cans, copying the tapes and the printing output, but not at all good at numerical calculations. So typical operating systems at this time were FMS, that is Fortran Monitor System, and IBSYS and IBM's operating system for the 7094. So my dear uh, students and learners, what happened is that in second generation, the instructions or the, the activities were simplified into punched cans. And in this time or at this time, in fact, what we have already discussed, that method of representing the instructions was forming what we call assembly language. More of this information will be covered in the video by the title, Elementary Programming Principles 
o elementary programming or introduction to uh, computer programming. You can keep on watching for this video from MLSWAP ICT YouTube channel. So from there, from second generation, we moved on to the third generation, which was between 1960s or mid 1960s to early 1970s. At this time, the computers were electronically characterized of integrated circuits or ICs. So these ones replaced the transistors of second generation. The systems were also bunch processing systems, meaning they would be able to handle several jobs at the same time, or several jobs would be fed into them at the same time. But they were able to take better advantage of the computer's resources by running several jobs at once. So operating system designers at this time developed the concept of multi-programming in which several jobs were put in main memory at once, and then it will be the duty of the processor to switch on from one job to another as needed in order to keep the several jobs advancing while keeping the peripheral devices in use. I am going to explain more about multi-programming and the types of operating systems that will be next. Another major feature in that generation operating system was the technique that is called spooling. Spooling is an acronym which stands for simultaneous peripheral operations online. That is spool, spool, simultaneous peripheral operations online. In spooling, a high speed device like a disk interposed between a running program and a low speed device involved with the program in input and output. Instead of writing directly to a printer, for example, outputs are written to the disk. So programs at this time could run to completion faster and other programs could be initiated sooner when the printer became available and the outputs could be printed. From there, we moved on to fourth generation. My dear students and learners, the type of programming languages that were used in that generation moved from that level where interactions were in the form of what we call machine language, the zeros and ones or assembly language, and they moved on to a level where the instructions could be written in the form of uh, English-like statements. So a person would be able to understand them. So the operating systems for that generation were called a high level programming languages or high level operating systems because they were written in a language that was closer to a language that a human being can understand. And therefore, from that generation, we moved on now to the fourth generation. Fourth generation was between 1970s to 1989. These were electronically characterized of large scale integrated circuits, or in other words, the computers at this time had advanced a little bit or quite high. And at this level, the computers of this time, a single circuit would contain thousands of integrated circuits that we have seen in that generation. So in fourth generation, a single circuit contains hundreds and thousands of integrated circuits. And therefore that piece of circuit that was formed was called large scale integrated circuit. And therefore these chips contained thousands of transistors on a square centimeter of silicon. The age of the personal computer doubled. In other words, due to the advancement in technology of this time, there was now a probability of developing the first personal computer that a person could be able to use. So with the development of large scale integration circuits, operating system entered the next level, the fourth level, that we call personal computer and workstation age or level. In other words, the operating system that were developed at this time were those ones that could be able to support the personal computers that people could be able to use. And these operating systems are operating systems that could enable computers to be interconnected to each other. This is because the computers in this fourth generation were being linked to form networks 
and also from what we call international network or internet. So an operating system or the operating systems of this time were also developed so that they could be able to support this interconnectivity or this networking function. Remember, no hardware can work without a software telling it what to do and how to do it. So is the operating system. There is no hardware that can work if the respective operating system that is supposed to give it direction is not available. And therefore, for computers of this generation to be able to um, uh, uh, pass information to each other, then the operating systems had also to be developed to support this capability. So as a result, time sharing and real-time operating systems were developed to meet the needs of the users by this time. Remember, in this generation, the users wanted to share information. The people wanted to pass information from one computer to another and one person to another through the computer. And therefore, the operating systems at this time had to be developed to be able to support that capability. So the operating systems could be able to allow real-time operations and also the time of operation could be shared. I'll discuss about time sharing and um, uh, real-time operating systems and the types of operating systems in this presentation so that you can understand more about what those were all about. So time sharing technique was a variant of multi-programming technique in which each user had an online a terminal. So in other words, people could be placed at various sections or various places, and then they could be provided with a monitor and a keyboard through which they could do their entry. They could uh, insert the instructions, they could key in the instructions, and the operating system, which was an central based or centralized computer, could be able to give each of those people an opportunity uh, for their requests to be processed online and feedback given. So because the user is present and interacting with the computer, the computer system at this point had to respond quickly to user requests, otherwise user productivity could suffer. What this means is due to the introduction of this capability where people, several people could be connected to the same computer, but using their own terminals, due to the fact that each person was entering a request or making a request, the system that was receiving those requests had to have a capability to be able to attend each of the user's requests at that time. And therefore, the operating system at this point had to share the time available and distribute it uh, among us the various users or among us the various uh, terminal users. And therefore, the time was shared and also the resources, the central processing unit, and also to be shared so that some people could not take too long waiting for their feedback. So time sharing systems were developed to multi-program large number of simultaneous interactive users. In addition, operating systems were developed that made use of graphical user interface and those that would allow communication over networks. And disk-based operating system that is called a CP stroke M, that is control program for microcomputers was developed and rewritten to make it suitable for running on many microcomputers. Also, the operating system that is called disk operating system was developed, which was then revised and renamed MS-DOS or what we call Microsoft Disk Operating System. The CP stroke M and MS-DOS and other operating systems for early microcomputers were all based on users typing in commands from the keyboard. From there, we moved on, the operating system move on, moved on to the fifth generation. The fifth generation of operating systems were between the year 1989 to today. These operating systems were similar to those in the fourth generation, but they had more capabilities and were also more user friendly. These are the operating systems that the machines are, that we use or that we are using are making use of. So these operating systems could allow what we call parallel processing or can allow parallel processing. So operating systems for parallel processing were developed to efficiently exploit the underlying available hardware. These operating systems support, therefore, what we call parallel processing. The operating systems in this generation have been designed to respond to new developments in hardware 
new applications and new security threats that are emanating each and every day. So the main difference that distinguishes between the fifth generation operating systems from the fourth generation operating systems is that the operating systems in fifth generation facilitate managing of telecommunications with the computer technology through the use of artificial intelligence. This means that the fifth generation operating systems have genuine intelligent quotient. In other words, they have the capability to think almost like a human being and they sort out issues or problems from users almost like an expert, having the capability to reason logically and with real knowledge of the world. These operating systems have also enabled the computers to be able to respond to natural language input and are capable of learning and self-organization. In other words, these are operating systems that can allow you to speak into the computer and they are able to give you response after interpreting what you have said and almost in your normal language in your mother tongue. These operating systems have also enabled the computers to be able to accept spoken ones and can assist in decision making and can offer critical service to users instead of relying on human professionals. In other words, the operating systems in the fifth generation, that is the operating systems that I use today, can be able to receive instructions from users who speak. You just speak an instruction and the operating system picks that instruction, interprets it, makes a decision on what to do and gives you or the user feedback, just as a professional would have done. So these operating systems form what we call expert systems. So we can easily say that the operating systems in fifth generation are not only artificial intelligent operating systems, but can also be referred to as expert operating systems because they can be able to reason like a person and make decisions like an expert. But remember, these instructions have been coded by a programmer and then they have been fed or they have been put together to form what we are calling an operating system. So in as much as I'm saying that the operating systems of fifth generation have the capability to reason and make decisions like an expert, my dear students would remember that they are able to do this based on the program or that has been written. So these operating systems have been coded by experts and the experts have fed uh, the various instructions and solutions into the operating system so that when a user makes a certain request, that it triggers a certain set of instructions to be executed and a feedback is given out based on what the experts fed into the operating system. They can also support parallel architectures three-dimensional circuit design and superconducting materials. So our next subtopic is on operating systems structures. We have looked at the development or historical development or evolution of operating systems. This brings us to what we call the operating systems structures. Simply, when we are talking about operating systems structures, we are talking about how that operating system or those set of programs have been coded and have been arranged or organized. Remember we said that an operating system is a set of programs, a set of programs, program A, B, C, D, E, F, E, T, C. When they are put together and organized in a certain way to perform tasks in a certain order, to interact with the other application programs or the hardware in a certain order, to interact with the user in a certain order. That is what we are calling, or the, the product is what we are calling an operating systems structure. How has the operating system been structured? So these structures also match with the evolution because we moved from monolithic systems to advanced levels of structures that we are going to look at just now. So there are six designs or structures of operating systems. These are 
monolithic systems, layered systems, micro kernels, client server systems, virtual machines, and exo kernels. Let's now look at what each of these structures was all about. We begin with monolithic systems. This is a structure in which the entire operating system runs as a single program in kernel mode, and it's written as a collection of procedures, each of which can call any other when need be and are linked together into a single large executable binary program. In other words, in monolithic structure or monolithic system structure, the instructions were written as procedures following each other in a certain hierarchy. So we had a procedure one, then you move to procedure two, you go to the third one, the fourth one, the fifth one, etc. And they were all put together as a single program and stored together as a single program, a single large program that we are calling single large executable binary program. So when this technique is used, each procedure in the system has a well-defined interface in terms of parameters and results. And each one is free to call any other if the latter provides some useful computation that the former needs. Having thousands of procedures that can call each other without restriction often leads to an unworldly and difficult to understand system that we call big mess. To construct the actual object program of the operating system, when this approach is used, one first compiles all the individual procedures or the files containing the procedures and then binds them all together into a single executable file using the system linker. In terms of information hiding, there is essentially none. This is because every procedure is visible to every other procedure. In other words, when you develop a single program in form of procedures that are all stored together, a single procedure is able to interact directly with any other procedure directly once a request is made. And therefore, because every procedure is accessible to the other, every set of instructions are accessible to every other um, pro uh, procedure or instruction, then we simply say that the information in them is open, it's not hidden. So this is as opposed to a structure containing modules or packages in which much of the information is hidden away inside the modules and can only be officially designated at a certain entry points that are called from outside the module. Now, the issue of modules and the procedures, my dear students, will be very well understood in my other video on introduction to programming or elementary programming principles. Remember to check for this video from Emily Swap ICT YouTube channel so that you can understand more about procedures and modules. This organization suggests a basic structure for the operating system. This basic structure is number one, a many program that invokes the request service procedure. So we have one main procedure that is able to uh, make a decision as to how other procedures will be accessed and at what point. That's what we call a main program. Number two, a set of service procedures that carry out the system calls. So we have procedures that execute or implement the requests that have been made by the user from the main program. Number three, a set of utility procedures that help the service procedures. In other words, we have another uh, structure or another uh, procedure whose work is to perform what we call routine tasks as requested. So within a single processing period, a, a procedure for saving the resource of processing might be invoked or called very many times. So that procedure that is in charge of that saving activity is what we are calling utility procedure. So in this organization, we have main program, we have service procedures, we have utility 
procedures. So in this model, for each system call, there is one service procedure that takes care of it and executes it. The utility procedures do things that are needed by several service procedures, such as fetching data from user programs. Having said all that, then many of you might be wondering, how, the, how did this structure look like? The following diagram, therefore, is an illustration of the monolithic system operating systems structure. As you can see, my dear uh, students and my dear learners, you can see from this uh, diagram that just as I have said, in this structure, we had what we call the main procedure. It is through the main procedure that an instruction will be executed to go and invoke a service procedure. And then another one will invoke the next, another instruction in the main procedure will invoke the next, it is like that. And then each of the service procedures, if for example, from the main program, I invoke the service procedure, then within the service procedures, we had instructions written, instructions written, to perform certain activities. So for each of these activities to be executed, there was need to invoke a utility procedure to do it. So in terms of hierarchy, in this structure, on top, we have main procedure, which would invoke the service procedure, and the service procedure would invoke the utility procedure. So for a utility procedure to be invoked, by the user through the main program or the main procedure, it simply means that once the instruction has been issued through the main procedure, it must be passed to the service procedure and then the service procedures will then pass the requests to utility procedure. So that's how uh, this um, structure looked like. The second, Operating system structure is learned systems. This is an operating system structure whereby the operating system is organized or broken down as a hierarchy of layers, each constructed upon the one below it. How did this look like? So this system had six layers, which looked as follows. At the lower most level, which we call, or which was called layer zero, we had processor, allocation, and the multi-programming. So this level was called processor allocation and the multi-programming. The second layer was memory and RAM management. The third level, which is labeled as two, layer two, was composed of operator process communication, or it performed the activity of operator uh, processor communication. Then the third layer was input-output management. The fourth layer was user programs. And the fifth layer was the, operating, uh, the operator's layer. The operator's layer. So what did each of these layers do? What was the work of each of these layers? So layer zero. I have said was called processor allocation and multi-programming layer. This layer dealt with allocation of the processor, switching between processes, that is context switching, when interrupts or current or timers expired. It provides then the basic programming, multi-programming of the CPU. So simply put, it is this layer that could be able to execute the processing activities or invoke the processing activities. It directly impacted the central processing unit. The second layer was memory and RAM management. This layer allocated the space for processes in main memory and on a 512 kilos, kilowatt and RAM used for holding those processes or changes that could not fit in main memory. This layer made sure that the pages were brought into memory whenever they were needed. Now, simply put, this layer, that is layer one, or in other words, layer two, 
by the name memory and RAM management, this layer had a single task of handling or dealing with memory. Any activity that required memory, use of memory or access to memory was controlled at this layer. And I've said layer zero, which is layer one, is the layer that was dealing with the issues of processing. It is at this layer that the processor could be assigned to a program or to several programs based on the requests that have been made. So processor one, processing activities. The memory and RAM management, that is layer one, memory management. Number three was layer two, which is called operator process communication layer. This layer handled the communication between each process and the operator console or the user. Each process effectively had its own operator. So in other words, this layer, you can simply say it was the layer that handled processes. It handled processes. Layer three, or what we call layer three, but from the diagram is layer four, the layer labeled three was also called user programs layer. It took care of managing the input output devices and buffering the information streams to and from them. Each process could deal with abstract input output um, devices with nice properties instead of um, real devices with many peculiarities. Now, a correction here, my dear students, this layer, this layer was, is called input output devices and buffering layer. This layer is input, not user programs, but it is supposed to be input output devices and buffering layer. I repeat, this layer, layer three, is not user programs layer, but it is input output devices and buffering layer. The purpose of this layer, as I have said, was to take care of managing the input output devices and buffering information. So simply put, we can say that layer three was input output devices and buffering layer, and therefore it is simply handled input output devices. Then layer four, layer four, which of course is layer five from one diagram, the layer labeled the four had the name user programs layer. The user programs layer is the layer is the layer where the user programs were found. They did not have to worry about process, memory, console, or IO management. So in other words, the layer five, which is labeled as layer four, is the layer which dealt with programs directly with issues to do with programs. And the last layer, which we call the layer five, but of course is layer six, based on the diagram is the operator layer. This is the layer where the operator was located. So from the structure, the six layers of the layer structure OS, is bound to remember that these layers, these layers were organized as layer zero, processor allocation and multi programming, layer one, memory and RAM management, layer two, operator process communication, layer three, input output management, that means handling any requests made through input devices and also giving out uh, information. Then layer four, user programs, and layer five, the operator layer where the user was found. So in summary, the layered systems OS had six layers. The first layer, layer zero, was processor allocation, 
and multi programming. And what in this layer do? This layer dealt with allocation of the processor and in this do with processor. Then second layer, which is layer one, was called the memory and drum management. What in this layer do? This layer handled all matters to do with memory. That is memory management. Then layer three, which of course, layer labeled three, which in this case is our layer four, was called input output management layer. What in this layer do? This layer dealt with operator process communication. It handled each process and the operator. Then the next layer, the next layer is user programs layer. User programs layer. What did they do? The user programs layer, the user programs layer is where the user programs were found. So it handled programs directly. And then the last layer is the operator layer. That is layer number six or layer labeled as number five. What did it do? This layer is where the operator was found that the person who was dealing with issues of issuing or emanating or evoking certain requests. So the main drawbacks or disadvantages of the land structure included, number one, it needed appropriate definition of various layers, since layers can use functions of lower layer. It tended to be less efficient than other type of approaches in terms of time management. With the layered approach, the designer had a choice where to draw the kernel user boundary. Traditionally, all the layers went to kernel. A further generalization of the layered structure or layering concept was presented in what we call multix, that is multiplexed information and computing service system. What happened is that instead of the layers being arranged in a series of hierarchy or in a hierarchy like the way we have seen, the same layers that we have discussed, layer zero to layer five were organized in form of circles or concentric rings. As we saw in part one, where we are talking about how the user interacts with the operating system using the layered approach. So when a procedure in an outer ring, we tend to call a procedure in the inner ring, it had to make the equivalent of a system call, that is a trap instruction, whose parameters were carefully checked for validity before allowing the call to proceed. The third type of operating system structure is the virtual machines structure. This is an operating system structure that implemented time sharing, whereby it is separated the function of multi-programming and that of an extended machine with a more convenient interface than the bare hardware. The heart of the system, known as the virtual machine monitor, ran on bare hardware, did multi-programming, provided several virtual machines to the next layer up. So in other words, this type of operating system structure was simply developed to enable several programs to be able to be run at the same time with each being given a portion or a share of the available time. And these programs could be able to interact directly with their hardware. This tells you that the instructions or the instructions at this level with this structure were in machine language or in machine form so that they could be able to directly interact with the hardware. Unlike other operating systems, these virtual machines are not extended machines. Instead, they are exactly copies of the bare hardware, including I.O. interrupts, that is including I.O. interrupts, kernel user mode, and everything else the real machine has to do. Because each virtual machine 
is identified to be true hardware, each one can run any operating system that will directly or that run directly on the bare hardware. Different virtual machines can and frequently do run different operating systems. My dear students and my dear learners, just to remind you, I said in part one of this series that one of the main functions of operating systems was provision of a virtual machine. And I said in part one that the main purpose or function of virtual machine was to simplify and hide the complexities of what happens between the program and their hardware and what the user wants. And I said, through provision of what we call a virtual machine, the user is able to interact with the machine at a very simple level as if the machine is very simple because the complexities of what is happening is hidden from the user. So the operating system structure that brought about this aspect of provision of virtual machine that would hide the complexities of their hardware, allowing the user interacts at a very simple level with the machine is what we are calling the virtual machine operating system structure. Someone or some ran one of the descendants of OS360 from bunch or transaction processing, while others ran a single user interactive system called CMS or conventional monitor system for time sharing users. Simply, what we are saying is that the first operating system to implement the virtual machine was OS360. And this also uh, could be utilized under the conversational monitor system. So these are the ones in which this type of structure was used for the first time. When a CMS program executes a system call, the call is trapped to the operating system in its own virtual machine, just as it would if it were running on a real machine instead of a virtual one. CMS then issues the normal hardware I.O. instructions for reading its virtual disk or whatever is needed to carry out the call. These I.O. instructions are then trapped by the machine, the M370, which then performs them as part of it, simulation of the real hardware. So in other words, the first machine to make use of a virtual machine OS structure is the VM stroke 370. So this diagram illustrates how this OS structure worked. So the user would issue a system call or would issue a call. That call would be trapped by the CMS. And then it would be passed over to the M370. And then that would directly interact with the bare hardware. So at the bottom, we had bare hardware. Then between CMS and bare hardware, we had the M370. And then between the M370 and the user, we had input output instruction. That is the CMS. And then we had the person who was issuing that instruction. So the instruction will be issued. Then it will be trapped under the CMS. Then CMS will transmit it further to the M370, which will then uh, undertake or invoke the bare hardware to do what is required. By making a complete separation of the functions of multi-programming and providing an extended machine, each of the pieces can be much simpler, more flexible, and easier to maintain. The fourth uh, OS structure was client-server model. This is an operating system structure that implements most of the operating system functions in user processes, whereby to request for a service, a user process known as the client process sends the request to a server process, which then does the work and sends back the answer. It then distinguishes two classes of processes, the servers, each of which provides some service, and the clients, which use these services. Communication between clients and the servers is often by message passing. To obtain a service, a client process constructs a message saying what it wants and sends it to the appropriate service. The service then does the work and sends back the answer. The client and the server can be in the same machine 
or can be run on different computers connected by a local or a wide area network. My dear learners and my dear students, when you hear about the client server operating system structure, it's also good to remember about what we call clients and what we call servers in terms of computers. If a computer contains resources that are being requested from by other computers, then that computer is called a server, or the computers that are making the requests are called the clients. So for interaction or communication to take place between servers and the clients, then there is need for an operating system that is structured to support that capability. So this simply tells you that the development of client server operating system structure enabled networking to take place. So since clients communicate with the servers by sending messages, the clients need to know whether the messages are handled locally on their own machines or whether they are sent across a network to servers on a remote machine. As far as the client is concerned, the same thing happens in both cases. Requests are sent and replies come back. Therefore, the client server model is an abstraction that can be used for a single machine or for a network of machines. Simply put, if you have a single machine and you wanted to use that single machine at, as if it is several machines at the same time, then you need to have an operating system that can support the two machines to interact with each other, even though physically it's a single machine. And therefore, this operating system must be able to support client-server interaction. Increasingly, many systems involve users at their home PCs as clients and large machines everywhere running as servers. In fact, much of the web operates this way. A PC, personal computer, sends a request for a web page to the server and the web page comes back. This is a typical use of client server model in a network. In this context, the computer or the program that contains instructions that are being used by many other users making requests, that is a, a server. And the machine that contains that resource that is being used by many users is a server, where the computer or that program that is making a request, a similar request like requests that are being made by very many others, that is a client. So the client is the one which requests service from a server. So the operating system that is able to support that kind of interaction is what we are calling client server OS uh, structure. And this is how it looks. You can see we have client process, we have client process. Oh, and remember, when I talk about client process, this process can be, for example, this is a process that is making requests for document processing. This one can be for playing music. But then we have a server. So the program or the computer that has the responses that have been made by one the processor is a process server. So if this client is a one the processor um, process, then this server here, the one which will serve this request is a one the processing server. And then we have a terminal server and many other types of servers. We have file server, we have memory server. So the client process will make request for a server. For example, it can request for a process server, it can request for terminal server, it can also make requests to, for a certain file, so that uh, which will provide that feedback is a file server, but it can also request for a memory. So if a memory is being requested by several clients, then that becomes a memory server. That becomes a memory server. And therefore, in this model, in this model, in this model, uh, all the kernel does is to handle the communication between the clients and the servers. By splitting the operating system up into parts, each of which only handles one facet of the system, such a file service, such as file service, process service, 
terminal service or memory service, each part becomes small and manageable. Furthermore, because of the servers, or because all the servers run as a user mode um, processes and not in kernel mode, they do not have direct access to the hardware. Consequently, if a bug in the file server is triggered, the file service may crash, but not the entire system. Another advantage of this operating system structure is its adaptability to use in distributed systems. If a client communicates with a server by sending eight messages, the client need not know whether the message is handled locally or whether it was sent across the network to a server on a remote machine. The next operating system structure is called micro kernel. This is an operating system structure that has been designed to achieve high reliability by splitting the operating system up into small, well-defined modules, only one of which, that is the micro kernel, runs in kernel mode, and the rest run as relatively powerless ordinary user processes. In this case, all non-essential portions of the kernel are removed and implemented as system and user level programs. In particular, by running each device driver and file system as a separate user process, embark in one of these can crash that component, but cannot crash the entire system. Therefore, embark in the audio driver, for example, will not cause the sound to be encoupled or stop, but will not crash the computer. I repeat, in particular, by running each device driver and the file system as separate user processes, and bug in one of these um, can it crash that component, but cannot crash the entire system. Therefore, a bug in the audio driver, for example, will cause the sound to be gabbled or stop, but that will not make the computer to crash. In contrast, in a monolithic system with all the drivers in the same kernel, a buggy audio driver could easily reference an invalid memory address and bring the entire system to a grinding halt instantly. Generally, the, this operating system structure provides minimal process and memory management and a communications facility. They are especially common in real time industrial avionics and military applications that are mission critical and are very high reliability requirements. The following are some benefits of the micro kernel operating systems. One, that is operating system structure one, extending the operating system becomes much easier because you can add components as you generate them or as need arises. Number two, any changes made to the kernel tend to be fewer since the kernel is smaller. Number three, the micro kernel also provides more security and reliability. However, it has a disadvantage, which is it has poor performance due to increased system overhead for message passing. An example of better known micro kernel is what was called Minix 3 that took the idea of modularity to the limit, breaking most of the operating system up into a number of independent user mode processes. Simply put, my dear students and my dear learners, the micro kernel operating system structure was very good because it enabled the programmers or developers of software and operating systems to be able to modularize their large programs into smaller entities, either um, in form of procedures, or in other ones, in form of modules. The program or the following diagram illustrates a micro kernel operating system structure. This is exactly what I have tried to explain that when we came to this kind of operating system structure, various modules were developed as separate entities. And based on the type of modules, we had what we call the user programs, 
modules. We had the servers, the server modules, and we have even the driver modules. So all these operated in what we call the user mode. In other words, the user could be able to make requests, could be able to make requests through an application program, or a module could make a request, and that request could be attended to, uh, not by the kernel itself, that is the kernel mode, but by the shell, which is part of the operating system. This other diagram also illustrates the same. Here we have the user mode and the kernel mode. So the user mode could deal with application, could deal with the servers, could deal with the device drivers, and even file servers. So file servers, device drivers, Unix server, application, IPC, all these are just the examples of some of the modules that could be handled by micro kernel under the user mode. And the kernel mode, we have basic IPC, virtual memory, scaling, and next to that level is the hardware. So the kernel, the kernel cores, handlers are labeled SYS, system, that is short form of system. The device driver for the clock is also in the kernel because the scheduler interacts closely with it. All the other device drivers run are separate user processes. Outside the kernel, the system is structured as three layers or processes or running in user mode. The lowest layer contains the device drivers. Above the drivers is another user mode layer containing the servers, which do most of the work of the operating system. And the topmost layer is composed of user programs and the processes that send system calls to servers requesting for a certain service. The last operating system structure is called exocardial. This is an operating system structure in which the actual machine is partitioned, giving each user a subset of the resources with each virtual machine getting a certain range of blocks with the bottom layer running in kernel mode being a program that is called the exo kernel, whose job is to allocate resources to virtual machines and then check attempts to use them to make sure that no machine is trying to use somebody else's resources. An exokernel is a type of operating system where the kernel is limited to extending resources to sub-operating systems that we call libOSs, resulting in a very small, fast kernel environment. So the theory behind this method is that by providing a few abstractions, as possible programs are able to do exactly what they want in a controlled environment. The advantage of the exokernel scheme is that it saves a layer of mapping. The virtual machine monitor does not maintain tables to remap resources because the exokernel need only keep track of which virtual machine has been assigned which resource. This method still has the advantage of separating the multi-programming in the exokernel from the user operating system code in user space, but with less overhead, since all the exokernel has to do is keep the virtual machines out of each other's hair. Now let's look at types of operating systems. We have looked at the history of operating systems. We have looked at how the operating systems are structured. So based on the structures that we have looked at, various operating systems performed a certain type of work and in a certain way. So we have various types of operating systems that are used to perform 
certain activities and they work in certain ways. So as computers have progressed and developed, so have the operating systems. And this trend is going to continue as com new computers continue emerging and new problems arise that need to be solved. So the following is a list of the types of operating systems that are in use today. But remember that a certain type of operating system that you go and buy from the market can fit under more than one type if that operating system can be able to do more than one activity in a certain form. The first type of operating system that we're going to look at is bunch operating system. This is an operating system in which several similar jobs with similar needs are submitted to the CPU at the same time as a group, and then they are executed automatically, one after another, saving its time by performing the activities only for once. This result results in improved system utilization due to reduced time around or turnaround time. So in other words, this is an operating system that allows several similar jobs to be submitted or enter the CPU or enter the CPU at once, and then the CPU attends to each of them at a time. And therefore, there is no time wastage by the central processing unit trying to look for a certain job. So that's why we are saying that this type of operating system saves or minimizes the turn around the time. That is the time that it takes for the central processing unit to leave processing one, attending to one process and going to pick another and bring it in for processing. So there's no, there's very minimal time wastage or no time wastage at all at the CPU switches between one program and another or one process and another. However, it poses the following challenges or problems. Number one, lack of interaction between the user and the job. This is because once the jobs have been fed, it's the CPU's responsibility to attend to all of them the way they are. Number two, CPU is often idle because the speed of the mechanical input-output devices is slower than the CPU. So in other words, so is there is some time wasted by the CPU waiting for a certain response from a certain input output device. So if the CPU is making or is processing or attending to a certain program or a certain process, and there's any instruction that means some response from an input output device, it means that once that instruction is made, once the instruction to request for something is made, the CPU may waste some time waiting for feedback from the input output device. And number three, it is difficult to provide the desired priority. The second type of operating systems is time sharing operating systems. This is an operating system that enables the processor's time in a particular computer to be shared among multiple users located at various terminals simultaneously through the use of CPU scheduling and the multi-programming aspects therefore minimizing a system's response time. Multiple jobs are executed by the CPU by switching between them, but the switches occur so frequently and fast. Therefore, the user can receive an immediate response. So in other words, these are operating systems that allows one or more users to receive feedback once they have issued an instruction immediately just as if they are the only ones who are making use of that system. So the main advantages of time sharing operating systems are, number one, it provides the advantage of quick response. Number two, it avoids duplication of software, and it also reduces CPU's idle time. However, these type of, of operating systems also have disadvantages, some of which are, number one, there's a problem of reliability. Number two, there's question of security and integrity of user programs and data. And number three, we have a problem of data communication. The third type of operating systems is distributed operating system. This is an operating system that manages a group of distinct networked computers 
in multiple locations, making them appear to be a single computer as they communicate, cooperate and collaborate with each other in performing certain tasks using the relevant software and hardware. It is a model where distributed applications are running on multiple computers linked by communications. In other words, there is an operating system that allows remotely located and geographically located computers to be able to send their requests to a centralized computer and receive feedback. For example, if you have a bank that has the main office and the branches and the various branches are making requests to the main office for a certain service, then it means that in a networked environment, when one person makes a request from one office, that request is transmitted to the centralized office and the computer which is there will have to give feedback. So the operating system that is able to receive these requests from various computers that are geographically located and act on them and process them and then give feedback that computer will be making use of what we call distributed operating system. And distributed operating system is an extension of the network operating system that supports higher levels of communication and integration of the machines on the network. It involves a collection of autonomous computer systems capable of communicating and cooperating with each other through a network just as I have explained in relation to a centralized computer located in the main office and the computers at various branches that make requests which need to be attended to by the main computer at the main office. It provides a virtual machine abstraction to its users and wide sharing of resources like a computational capability or capacity, I.O., that is input, output, and the files, such that the users do not know on which machine their programs are running and where their files are assorted. This means, like if there's a person who is making a request to access his or her account using a computer from a certain branch, this person will not even know that the kind of information he or she is requesting for is located very far away, in a very far away computer or in an office which is very far away from where he or she is. And this person will also not know whether there are other people who are making similar requests like him or her at the same time. So the complexities of what is happening around and who is doing what are hidden from the user. And therefore the user just interacts with his or her terminal at a very simple level without knowing what is happening behind the scenes. And that is one purpose or main goal of distributed operating systems. The next type of operating system is network operating system. This is an operating system that runs on a server and it provides it with the capability to manage data, users, groups, security, applications, and other networking functions, as well as allowing sharing of resources among multiple computers in a network. Simply put, there's an operating system that is able to attend to more than one computer at the same time, servicing the requests as they are being received. It enables the interconnection of devices or computers to be functional. That's why it's called network operating system. A network is an interconnection, interconnection of various components like a computer, so several computers, and even a single printer that is being shared among us the computers. So that interconnection of devices is what we are calling a network. And the operating system that is able to control what is happening and make that interconnection uh, to be functional is what we are calling network operating system. Its main advantage include centralized servers are highly stable. Number two, security is server managed. Number three, upgrades to new technologies and hardware can be easily integrated into the system. Number four, remote access to servers is possible from different locations and the types of systems. It's important, my dear student and my dear learner, to know, just as I have said, or as I said at the beginning of this subtopic, that a single operating system can fit under several types. This is very true because if an operating system 
is a distributed one, meaning it is able to control and manage requests being made from various other computers that are geographically located, then it simply means that such an operating system can fit to be called a network operating system because it is able to control or manage that network whose terminals are geographically distributed. So some of the disadvantages of this type of operating system are number one, there is high cost of buying and running a server. Number two, dependency on a central location for most operations. Number three, regular maintenance and updates are required. The fifth type of operating system is real-time operating system. This is an operating system that guarantees to process events or data by a specific moment in time such that the time taken by the system to respond to an input and display of required updated information is so small that it controls the environment. The two main types of real-time operating systems are, number one, hand real-time system. So the time for processing is fixed and it can't be changed. And thus, data is processed as its intent. This type of operating systems guarantee that critical tasks complete on time. The second type is soft real-time operating system. Time for processing can be altered and thus data entered is processed after some duration has elapsed. A critical real-time task gets priority over other tasks and retains the priority until it completes. The next type of operating system, my dear students and learners, is serial processing operating system. This is an operating system by which instructions on data are executed in a sequential manner based on the order of entry. A program counter is used to determine which instruction is going to execute and which instruction will be executed next. Then we have what we call mode processor operating system. What is a mode processor operating system? This is an operating system that is capable of supporting and utilizing more than one processor in the same computer system. Therefore, enabling execution of many jobs at the same time because all the operations are divided into the number of CPUs in existence. So multiprocessing system is based on the symmetric multiprocessing model in which each processor runs an identical copy of operating system and these copies communicate with each other. In this system, processor is assigned a specific task. The main disadvantage of multiprocessor system is that to get more work done in a shorter period of time. In other words, the main advantage of multiprocessor operating systems is that they allow more work to be done within a very short time. Moreover, multiprocessor systems prove to be more reliable in the situations of failure of one processor. In this situation, the system with the multiprocessor will not hurt the system. It will only slow it down. Multiprocessor systems support the processes to run in parallel. This is the ability of the CPU to, to simultaneously process incoming jobs. Our eighth type of operating system is parallel operating systems. This is an operating system that is used to manage multiple networked computers so as to complete tasks that have been distributed between them, therefore allowing a user to directly interface with all the computers in the network. It works by dividing sets of calculations 
into smaller parts and distributing them between the machines on a network. To facilitate communication between the processor, cores, and the memory arrays, routine or routing software has to either share its memory by assigning the same address space to all of the networked computers or on distribute its memory by assigning a different address space to each processing call. Then we have what we call multi-threading operating systems. These are operating systems that allow different parts of a software program to run concurrently. The next type of operating systems is templated operating systems. This is an operating system that is applied in a distributed and cloud computing context to create a single virtual machine image as a guest operating system, then saving it as a tool for multiple running virtual machines. The technique is used both in visualization and the cloud computing management and is common in large server warehouses. Our next type of operating system is embedded operating systems. These are operating systems that are designed to be used in embedded computer systems. They are designed to operate on small machines like personal digital assistants, that is PDS, with less autonomy. They are able to operate with a limited number of resources. They are very compact and extremely efficient by design. In fact, it's good for me to remind you, my dear student, that in the video that I called or that is already posted in MLSOP ICT YouTube channel by the name Introduction to Computers, I talked about a certain type of um, computer that was called embedded computers. And I said that when you purchase a certain kind of device, like a refrigerator or a fridge, you end up buying a computer without knowing. And I said that computer is usually in form of a part of that uh, device. So when you purchase a refrigerator, within that refrigerator, there's a part in it that is a computer. And that computer is called a bended computer. So the operating system that makes that computer to function is what we call the embedded operating system. The next type of operating systems are library operating system. This is an operating system in which the services that a typical operating system provides, such as networking, are provided in form of libraries. These libraries are composed with the application and the configuration code to construct unikernels. What is a unikernel? Unikernels are a specialized single address space machine images that are constructed using library operating system and can be deployed to cloud or abandoned environments. Let's now look at job control. What is job control? In computing, job control refers to the control of multiple tasks or jobs on a computer system, ensuring that they each have access to adequate resources to perform correctly, that the competition for limited resources does not cause a deadlock where two or more jobs are unable to complete, resolving such situations where they do occur and terminating jobs that for any reason are not performing as expected. Job control also refers to the protocol for allowing a user to move between multiple process groups or jobs within a single login session. 
In Unix and Unix-like operating systems, job control refers to control of jobs by a shell, especially interactively, where a job is a shell's representation for a process group. Every process belongs to a process group. When a process is created, it becomes a member of the same process group and the session as its parent process. Basic job control features are or include suspending, resuming, or terminating of all processes in the job or process group. More advanced features can also be performed by sending signals to the job. The process belonging to a single command are called a process group or a job. This is so that you can operate on all of them at once. A job consists of one or several steps, each of which is a request to run one specific program. A session is a larger group of processes. Normally, all the processes that stem from a single login belong to the same session. A job is usually broken down into job steps. All the statements required to run a particular program constitute a job step. Jobs are a background, sometimes called bunch units of work that run without requiring user intervention. For example, after the user has requested a word processor to print a certain job, and several jobs are sent to the printer, the printer will attend to all the jobs in the order of arrival without requesting for any uh, input from the user. So the printing, that process of printing or that work of printing is what you can call a print job. And there can be very many other types of jobs. In addition, the operating system manages interactive or what we call foreground user requests that initiate units of work. In general, foreground work is given a priority of a background work. So in reference to job uh, control, what is job control language or, or JCL? JCL is a scripting language executed on an IBM mainframe operating system for instructing the system on how to run a bunch job or start a subsystem and it consists of control statements that designate a specific job for the operating system. JCL was developed as a primitive instruction, requesting resources to be made available during execution or assignment of file names or on devices to device numbers referenced by the job. One common feature of job control language is the unit of work, which is called a job. A job consists of several small steps for running a specific program and is identified by cans that we call job cans, which indicate the beginning of the job and definite exactly how the job is to be executed. JCL provides a means of communication between the application program the operating system and the system hardware. Operating systems JCL, operating systems JCL consists of three basic statements. The first statement is job statement. The job statement identifies the start of the job and information about the whole job, such as billing, running priority and the time as well as space limits. Number two, the exec statement, which identifies the program to be executed in this step of the job and information about the step. Number three, or the done statement is the data definition um, statement. This statement identifies a data file to be used in a step and detailed information about that file. 
The DD statements, that is data definition statements, can be in any order within the step. And therefore, when you talk about operating system job control language, it's important for you as a student to remember that this refers to three types of statements or use of three types of statements, one of them being the statement that identifies the start of the job and all the information about that job. And that is what we call job statement. The second statement being the statement that identifies how the program or how the job will be executed. And it is called the exec statement, which stands for the execution statement. And the third statement, which identifies the data file or the data or the location where a file, where the data is, that will be being used during the process of execution. And it is called the data definition statement. So the data definition statement identifies a data file to be used in each step. And within it, you find the details of all that it contains. Then the execution statement identifies the program to be executed at each step and information about how the process will proceed. And the job statement that identifies the job and it contains information about that job. Number two, we have command language or a command script. This is a domain specific interpreted programming language through which a user communicates with the operating system or an application. The part of the operating system that responds to operating system commands is called the command processor. It is the channel for user input and it must be capable of expressing all possible transactions, whether they are issued from the keyboard or from some graphical pointing device. Some common examples of a command language are a shell or bunch programming languages. These languages can be used directly at the command line, but can also automate tasks that would normally be performed manually at the command line. They share this domain, lightweight automation with scripting languages, though a command language usually has a strong coupling to the underlying operating system. Interactive systems include command languages or command files that can be run non-interactively, but these usually do not provide as robust an environment for running and attending jobs as JCL. The following are therefore the main advantages of command languages. Number one, they are very easy for all types of users to write. Number two, they do not require the files to be compiled. Number three, they are easy to modify and make additional commands. Number four, they are very small files. Number five, they do not require any additional programs or files that are not already found on the operating system. The following are, however, the main disadvantages of command languages. Number one, they can be limited when comparing with other programming languages or scripting languages. Number two, they may not execute as fast as other languages or compounded programs. Number three, some command languages often offer little more than using the commands available for the operating system used. Then we have what we call system messages. If operating systems running in one or more central uh, processor complex images support console integration and are customized to allow using the console as an operating system console, then use operating system messages to number one, display 
manage and respond to operating system messages from the CPC images. Number two, send operating system commands to the central processor complex images. And for this reason, an operating system may issue any number of messages at any time. The console receives the messages automatically and stores them in a message log. The console also runs or turns on several console indicators to help you recognize that the priority operating system messages were received. A priority operating system message either requires a response from the console operator or notifies the console operator of a critical condition that requires immediate action or attention. The operating system generates various types of messages of which most are error messages. Examples include action messages, alarm test, allocator messages, ARBMGR messages, AV pair messages, BCDL2 messages, among the others. Lastly, let's look at operating systems installation. Before you install an operating system, you need, first of all, to ensure that you have that operating system, and you must therefore be able to know which operating system you are going to install in your device. And therefore, it's important to begin by looking at how you select operating system. The operating system is the foundation of the computer and must be carefully chosen. Choosing an operating system may be hard to do, especially if you have no knowledge of what operating system and which operating system has to offer which service or which operating system has which capability. Therefore, the following are some of the main factors that we need to consider before deciding which one of the operating systems you need to use for a certain purpose and in a certain environment. Number one, hardware provision and basic design of the computer. Number two, you need to look at the applications that you intend to use with the computer. Number three, the method of communication with your computer. Number four, the method of operating your computer. Number five, availability in the market. Number six, it's, it's reliability and security provided by the operating system. Number seven, it's user friendliness. Number eight, the documentation available. Number nine, the total cost of ownership. Number 10, the number of users it can support. Number 11, the level of human resources needed to support the operating system. And number 12, the number of processors and hardware it can support. Simply put, before you make a decision as to which operating system you need to purchase and install your device, you need to ask yourself whether the operating system you're going to look for can support more one or more processors and hardware. You also need to find out whether the operating system that you want to purchase can be easily used or there are people who are able to use it and how many are they, and whether if it has problems, you can be able to get some people that are knowledgeable on how to repair it. You also need to ask yourself whether the operating system you are going to purchase is able to support either one or several users so that if you are going to use that operating system to support use by several people, then you need to ensure that you purchase an operating system that allows more than one user. 
you also need to consider the cost of purchasing that uh, operating system because some may be very costly but without much service while others may be cheap but with a lot of service you also need to ask yourself whether the operating system you want to select contains some documents that explain how it is supposed to be used and how the repairs are supposed to be done or errors are supposed to be rectified in the case they occur. You also need to ask yourself whether you and other people know how to use that software or that operating system and whether it is easy to use. You also need to ask yourself whether that program is stable or whether it can be relied upon, whether it can offer you the service that you need continuously without breaking down and whether it offers you with some security mechanisms to protect your data and information in your machine. You also need to ask yourself whether that software is available in the market because you might purchase an operating system which is not available. And in the case, the one which you are using collapses or breaks down due to bugs or errors, you have no way of replacing it. You also need to ask yourself about the method that you use to operate that computer whether you interact with the computer using other devices like keyboard, mouse, and others, or whether you just type directly or you speak to it. You also need to ask yourself about the method of communicating with the computer that you have, whether it's the use of a microphone or whether it is directly or whether it is through a network. And you also need to ask yourself about the activities that that operating system can be able to support based on the number of activities that you need to undertake with your computer and you also need to ask yourself whether that operating system that you want to purchase can be able to support the design of the hardware or the computer that you have. So my dear students and my dear learners, you may always remember, you don't just run to the market and purchase an operating system just because you have a hunch that somebody has installed or purchased a certain operating system. You must go for an operating system that fits your environment and that is able to support you in your work. Once you have been able to acquire the operating system, then the next step is to install the software. My dear students and my dear learners, it is good for me to refer you to a video that is already posted in MLSWAP ICT YouTube channel by the title, Hardware and Software acquisition process and installation. There's also a video that talks about software and installation, that is computer software and installation. I would advise you to read more about operating systems and the rest of the software and that video on the computer software and the installation so that you can be able to understand more about software and how you install. Because the explanations that I've given there are similar and more detailed as these details here on installation. So to read more and understand more, kindly look for that video from MLSWAP ICT YouTube channel on computer software and installation. So once you have acquired your software, how do you install it? Step number one, determine which operating system you need to install. Number two, check the system requirements. Number three, decide whether to purchase or download the software. Number four, research your software compatibility. That means find out more about that operating system so that we are also able to know whether it can be installed in your machine. So you need to understand your machine and what it is capable of doing so that we're also able to know whether the operating system that we want to install will succeed or not. Number five, obtain your new operating system. Number six, back up your data. So if, for example, you want certain data in your machine and you want to install, 
And now, depending the version of that operating system, it's going to make a backup because you may never know what may happen. The machine may fail while in the process of installation. And if you're not done backup, you might lose it. So always backup your data. Once you have done that, then the next step is to install your operating system. How do you install? Number one, determine your installation order, the process you are going to follow to install. Number two, insert that uh, storage medium like DVD or CD that contains your operating system into its drive and boot your computer from that disk. Number three, try your operating system distribution before installing. In other words, before you install your operating system, make several copies of the same, but remember, it will depend with the license you have acquired, but it's good to make a copy of that operating system so that for any reason, you may be able to have some backup of the same. And you can store some of that operating system in the hand disk or on a CD or even on a DVD. Then wait for the set. Once you have been starting that operating system in your machine, wait for the setup program to load. In other words, after you have inserted your CD or DVD that contains operating system and you have put in your computer, it's always going to wait for the setup program to launch. Once the program launches and you are requested to enter a product key, key in on the space provided the product key for that OS, this key will always be supplied to you by the seller of the operating system because every system and the license that goes with it contains a certain key. So this key will be provided to you. And therefore, once the setup program has begun and it prompts you for the key, enter the key. Then choose your installation type. It may be custom or any other type that may be provided to you. So choose from that screen, select the type of installation that you want to do. Then during that process of installation, the operating system may request you on whether you want to install that operating system with the existing partition or create partitions. And as a result, you also be requested to format your partitions. So format the partition in which the operating system will be loaded if that partition is free and you have no fear of losing anything. After all, we have already said that before you carry out the installation, it's always going to back up your data. And this includes any programs that you might have stored in your computer. Then set your operating systems installation options. Based on the options that will be displayed on the screen, select the options that are applicable to you. Then once you have done that, wait for the installation to complete. As the installation process gets completed, the operating system may prompt you to create a login details for security purposes. And therefore, when that screen appears, create your operating systems login details. And then finally, install your drivers and the programs. So after the operating system has completed the installation, then if there are certain drivers that you have like for printers and ETC and other programs, you move on and install them. And after all, usually, once the installation process is complete, that operating system may run certain um, drivers automatically and even some programs. But even if that does not happen, once you are through with the installation of the operating system, you should proceed and install the various drivers and the programs as you need. With that, we have come to the end of this topic and this video by the title, Introduction to Operating Systems. This video has been a continuation for the video by the title, Introduction to Operating Systems Part 1, 
which is already posted in MLSwap ICT YouTube channel. You can access this video and other ICT and computer related videos by searching for MLSwap ICT YouTube channel. In addition, to access live skills, motivational and inspirational videos, search for the YouTube channel by the name MLSwap Enterprises International. You can subscribe to the two YouTube channels by clicking on subscribe button just next to the name of the channel if it's currently reads as subscribed so that it becomes subscribed. However, if it already reads as subscribed, it means that you are already a member of MLSWAP ICT YouTube channel. And if it also is subscribed for MLSWAP Enterprises International YouTube channel, it also means that you're already a member. And therefore, if the term subscribe, rings are subscribed under any of the two channels, don't click on it because you are already a member of the channel. For any additional correspondence, write it to us through the email mlswap at gmail.com. I wish you a blessed standard time as you interact, listen, and watch the various videos that I have posted under MLSWAP ICT and MLSWAP Enterprises International. If you find out that there's a video that we're interested with and it's not currently posted under MLSWAP ICT or MLSWAP Enterprises International, kindly wait, keep watching because that video is coming. You can as well write to us through mlswap at gmail.com to make a request for any video that you would like to be posted and we shall do our best to provide you with that video. May God bless you and I wish you all the best. Thank you very much.